This episode of Cartoon Corner is brought to you in part by tblocks.com. Stay till the end of the review to see how you can earn 10% off your purchase of T-Blocks' monthly limited edition shirt box. Toongrin.com You know, I never really tried marmalade before. No, I never even heard of an orange jam. But it it fits with the movie, so <laughs> thank God. As you can tell, I'm not one of those adventurous of eaters. Three, two, one, go. That is citrusy. Now I can see why Paddington liked this. Likes this. Yeah. There's a little bit more. Whoa! Yeah, oh, that's that is very citrus. But now we get to see our favorite marmalade-loving bear, as Cartoon Corner is revealing Paddington. Hello again, I'm Y-Boy, and I'm here to ask, why do most live-action adaptations of children's cartoons suck? This isn't just opinion, though. General consensus is usually that these sort of adaptations are the most juvenile, pandering, moronic, and sipping movies around, pains to watch for both kid and adult. Why do we always get these overly simplistic eyesores? I mean, obviously, basing your movie on a cartoon is an easy out for studios to have their cynical cash grab. It's a verifiable fan base right there, ready and ripe to have squeezed dry up all their nostalgia dollars. Because, let's be honest, do you think anybody had any care for adapting most of these movies outside of making moolah? I mean, really. Do you think there are fans of Alvin and Chipmunks working on those films who said, Gee whiz, I always wanted to see Alvin literally eating poop. Theodore, did you just... We know our it's just a raisin. Prove it. <laughs> okay. Dude, you owe me big time. Oh. This sounds a key problem that animation in general has. That line of logic, uh, it's for kids, so who gives a crap anyway? They'll love anything we put in front of their stupid faces. Hey, Smolder, do you want to see a video of me finding a dead body? No way, Harold. I'm going to be watching videos of YouTubers being culturally disrespectful and never apologizing for it. Yay! <laughs> YouTube. I feel like we need more positive influences in this genre of media. Enough of the cynical cash grabs, the morose money grubbing, and the venomous approach to pop culture iconography. I want to try and stretch my reviewing legs to cover more positive topics. Because sure, covering something that's junk is easy, but who's ever heard of a truly good live action cartoon adaptation? Well, you heard of one now. To give a brief history, Paddington is originally from a 1958 book called A Bear Called Paddington, and later spun off into a series of books, animated shows, an adorable stuffed toyland, and even became today's 2014 film Paddington. The basic premise is about a small bear from deepest, darkest Peru, who wears a blue duffel coat and red hat, and is named after Paddington Station, where he is found and adopted by an English family called the Browns. 
antics ensues, as although Pennington has that stereotypical British politeness, he's also a whirlwind of clumsy, cuddly chaos waiting to happen. I'm mostly familiar of the 1997 cartoon, The Adventures of Paddington Bear, which was what I watched as a kid and enjoyed for its calmer atmosphere and comedic timing. But we aren't talking about the 90s, but the 2010s, which is still within the realm of the era where classics like... Those were still around. But, let's see how Paddington breaks the mold. In the realm of box art design, this is a nice and bold one. The use of contrast of blue and yellow makes it immediately recognizable when you want to pick it out of the DVD shelf. And apart from the simple front shot of Paddington, I fear sort of the lazy trend of animated headshot movie covers. Why is he looking to the side like that? It just makes me picture that Steve Urkel on, Did I do that? Gotta give credit though, it kind of works with the idea of the London skyline being so vast and large behind him, and him up front being, of course, eating a marmalade sandwich and being all small. But on to the movie. Smolder, press play! Hey, hey, way boy! Ooh, you won't be seeing that in the sequel. The film starts out as an old school documentary, detailing the travels of a great British explorer to deepest, darkest Peru, sporting nothing but his wits, trusty moustache, and several slaves. You think the joke is the travel piano? No, 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 audience, you have been bested once again by British charm. You must beware of his majestic mustache. But Major Mustache is in danger from a scorpion sting. But there is no need to worry, as he is saved by some ninja bears who he befriends with civilized talk and crushed orange jam. Thus, after making friends, Major Mustache gives his hat to the eldest bear, Uncle Pastuzo, and then signs up the film with... And if you ever make it to London, you can be sure of a very warm welcome. The same could be said if the explorer was Canadian, but instead of marmalade, we would introduce him to the wonders of maple syrup. And if he were American... <laughs> Cut to years later to a naked Paddington in Peru, making some marmalade with his Uncle Pastuso and Aunt Lucy. Where are his parents, you ask? According to the book, they died in an earthquake, but according to the movie, they died of off-camera osis, a tragic disease most commonly found in Disney parents. Nevertheless, we are introduced to Paddington and his family, who after the explorer's influence have taught themselves to speak, exhibit polite manners, set up reoccurring jokes. A wise bear always keeps a marmalade sandwich in his hat in case of emergency. Basic mechanics, and how to die tragically in an earthquake. Oh no. He pulled a Disney. Tragic. And not even caused by evil man this time, and although we didn't know Panton's uncle all that well or long, it still is pretty sad when Panton finds his uncle. Aunt Lucy. <gasps> now I could blur that, but you could cool with corpses, right? After tenderly consoling one another, Pennington and Lucy make their way to a shipyard to board a boat to finally go to London. But alas, Aunt Lucy can't come, now feeling too old and tired to make the trip. And to be fair, paddling from deepest, darkest Peru at nearly a hundred years old, I think she deserves a rest. But what about little Pennington? How will he make his way in London alone? What if they don't even like bears? You know, there was once... A war in the explorer's country. Thousands of children were sent away for safety, left at railway stations with labels around their necks, and unknown families took them in and loved them like their own. They will not have forgotten how to treat a stranger. Oh, Aunt Lucy is such an endearing character. And her positive worldview and philosophy is what truly guides Paddington to be one of the most likable characters I've ever seen. But we'll see more of that as the movie continues, so we'll discuss about it then. Wait a minute, was that a parallel to children, refugees, and World War II? With a kiss and bestowing a Pastuzo's hat, Paddington is off to London, arriving there with a more tasteful fart joke. Hmm. 
Roll your eyes all you want, but subversive fart jokes like that are at least leagues above fart jokes like this. <laughs> But back to our cup at Paddington Station. Unfortunately, Lucy's words don't reflect the douche baggotry of commuters at rush hour, and Paddington ends up alone, being pressured for marmalade sandwiches by pigeons. Their beady eyes taste your fear, Paddington. Then enters the Brown family, Henry, Mary, Judy, and Jonathan, on the way home from a family trip, and they have their magical run-in with Paddington Bear. Good evening. No, thank you. Oh dear. Well, that wasn't very magical. <laughs> Must be doing something wrong. Oh, there it is. Hello there. Mary. Oh, hello. And cute touch with the found light. Being a good Samaritan, Mary and the kids go to find some help for Panton, while Henry babysits them for a tad, taking part in some friendly banter. What's your name? Hmm? Do bears even have names? Hmm, of course we do. My name is... Right. Well, go on. Hmm? You try it. Look at the throat. Mr. Brown, that is extremely rude. Yeah, Henry, that's their bare word. How dare you! So with Mr. Brown's egregious mispronunciation, the family decide to give Paddington an English human name. Like what? Oh look, Henry, it's perfect. You want to call him Ketchup? No. Ketchup the bear? Paddington. Paddington. Just be grateful you weren't in Punky Doodles, Ontario, little bear, or that'd be a much different movie. That is a real place. Probably worth a giggle. So Mary Brown brings Paddington home with them, where only Jonathan, Mary, and their housekeeper Mrs. Bird, aka coolest old lady ever, seem glad for the new furry guests. Judy is just too gush dirt embarrassed by the weird little bear, and Henry, who works as a risk analyst, just doesn't believe Paddington's story, and just wants to alert the authorities to... House you in some kind of government facility. What? Like an orphanage? <laughs> No, 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 not an orphanage. It would be more like an institution for young souls whose parents have, sadly, passed on. The English, even making horrible places sound just so gosh darn proper. What happens next can be best described as just the trailer footage. This is a gripe I hold with many movie trailers. Zootopia, Coco, even Dean Titans Go to the Movies did it. Just showing a joke, a scene, a moment in its entirety without context. On paper, that would make you think that would entice viewers to come watch it, cause oh geez, that slot scene was hilarious, that Coco spanning shot was so glorious, that Teen Titans fart joke was... No. By and large, by having this place the entire scene style of trailer editing, all creators do is just spoil these key points in their movies. And at best, it just leaves the audience just feeling like... <laughs> he farted. That wasn't a fart. <laughs> that was just air leaving my butt. Which is a fart. <laughs> yep, I've certainly seen this before. Paddington just gets a bit of leeway with me, as unlike in Coco or Zootopia, the scenes spoil were narrative points exposed. Paddington's bathtub ride is strictly an enforcement of his accident-prone and polite nature. Nothing in the trailer actually spoils the story. Case in point, the trailers completely miss this framing device of Paddington introducing each of the Browns family's quirks and characters in this beautiful dollhouse set piece, showing Henry and his overprotective and risk-analyzing tendencies, Mary's quirks and creativity as a book illustrator and devoted mother, Jonathan's genius and recklessness developing explosives and crazy machines made of pinwheels, I guess, Judy's shut-down teenage angst and tenacity to study and learn new languages, including Chinese and bear. <laughs> Wonderful pronunciation. Mr. and Mrs. Brown, this is brilliant characterization. 
The trailer is also never brought up Nicole Kidman, the museum owner who has a side hobby of being a homicidal overzealous taxidermist. An odd choice to pair with the cute little bear with the lady stuff and little monkeys, but to each their own. Now, not to jump ahead, but Kidman's character brings up a question of is such a more serious and darker villain a fit for a Panton Bear story? By contrast, in the sequel, Hugh Grant plays the villain Phoenix Buchanan, who is played off vastly more campy and comedic, wearing silly costumes, doing voices and mugging to get you that childish chuckle while still showing an edge of antagonistic danger to him. Kidman's role plays more straight-laced danger, not one to crack a joke unless it involves dismemberment. When somebody doesn't give me what I want, <laughs> I remove their body parts. <gasps> I start with the nasal hair. <laughs> oh. And then I move on to something juicy. <laughs> now, whether this is a good villain for a true light-hearted comedy, it sort of boils down to whether you want a villain that's more humorous and funny, or one with a true thematic edge to her. <laughs> But we'll talk about thematics and pending stuffing soon enough. As for now, Mary and Panton get to talking about the explorer that went to Peru. Panton hoping that the explorer will help him find a family that will actually let him stay in their home. Mary tells Panton that her friend Mr. Gruber at the local antique shop might be able to find him by looking at the origin on his trusty red cap. But first we get a bit of background on Mr. Gruber's past. There was a lot of trouble in my country. So my parents sent me all the way across Europe. When I was not much older than you are now. Was it hard to find a home? I had a great aunt who took me in. But I soon learned a home is more than a roof over your head. A brilliant parallel to Pangdon's situation. As like the kid refugees in World War II, Pangdon suffered a tragedy and was forced to come to London in search of a home. This is a smart way to pull from history and the tragedies of war so young audiences can understand the parallels without it being too over the top or morose a subject matter. Why can't other kid properties be this clever with history? If it hadn't been for you, I would be now in someone else's digestion. But forget that, we got bare shenanigans to have as Pension tries to return a stolen wallet to a pickpocket. Tiny police bear. Hey, at least Pennington was pretty good at being an impromptu police bear. You should have seen the last bear they put on the force. But like I said, with Pennington's polite catcher of the pickpocket, he is praised as a hero by the townsfolk and earns some cool points with Judy and her classmates. More importantly though, Mr. Gruber discovers Pennington's hat was given to all the members that are part of the Geographer's Guild. So come morning, Pennington can go down and hopefully find the explorer's name. But back at the Brown residence, Henry is slightly peeved that Mary went against his wishes to take Pennington to the authorities and wants him out. I am taking charge. You're taking charge, eh? Yes. Right. Paddington is a danger to this family. Jonathan is quite irresponsible enough without throwing a wild animal into the mix. Have you seen the paper? Gosh. You've only been in London a day and you're already famous. I'm sorry if I wasn't very nice before. It's just, it's a new school and I didn't want everyone to think I was weird. Oh, I understand, Judy. It's not easy being somewhere new. No. It isn't. And that's how you make a teenage girl archetype instantly humanized. You should take a tip from her, Vanilla. I am in the middle of addressing my audience. Shush. Hello, days and vase. It is I, Vanilla, or Sprinklet, and I am here to do a challenge for you today. The obvious detergent poison challenge. Let's see how cool I can be. Seriously though, why are teens eating that literal poison? <laughs> so admittedly not giving the best first impression, the kids help Pennington clean up and give him his spiffy signature blue duffel coat, making him... Look like one of the family. Oh. You're not going to send Paddington to the authorities, are you? You will try at the Geographer's Guild. Yes, all right. We'll yes. see if they know anything. But if it's a dead end... I'm sure it won't be. 
Don't worry, we'll save that heart-stomping scene for the sequel to make your kids cry. Now with Henry on board to help, he and Pennington make their way to the Geographer's Guild. But at the same time, Kidman has tracked down our marmalade chum and has started sticking out their house, which hasn't been ignored by the neighborhood busybody, Mr. Curry. You're placing unauthorized advertising material in a public telephone box. I'm terribly sorry. Hello? Is it me you looking for? Wow, you gotta commend the makeup and costume department. They made a nine year difference in the actor's ages look like a model paired with a moldy sock. Clearly, now that Curry has been spinned by Kidman, she finds her in to kidnap Paddington, sealing the deal by putting some more bare racism in Curry's head. Oh, but it always starts with just one, Mr. Curry. Soon the whole street will be crawling with them. Drains clogged with fur, buns thrown at old ladies, raucous all night picnics. <sighs> This is some odd bear racism. It's not cartoony over the top like Christopher Walken in The Country Bears. It's not even gruff and out of place serious like Charlton Heston in Alaska. I'm accustomed to getting what I want. I want that bear. This is just bear racism. Just as well. Don't want to be kept up by any of your loud jungle music. And it's really weird. With Kidman's dastardly plan in motion, we go to Henry and Pennington, arriving at the Geographer's Guild, home of the most magically overcomplicated message tube system. They ask the front desk if the Guild has ever made an expedition to Peru, but the secretary is quick to coldly shut them down with a no. So Pennington becomes immediately suspicious that they may be hiding something, while Henry has some warranted concerns. Pennington, please don't take this the wrong way, but are you certain there was an explorer? You didn't just find a hat? Make up some. What? Why are you looking at me like that? Is it me or is it hot in here? Why do I feel so uncomfortable? Mm. Flushed. Mm. Queasy. Mm. It's called a hard stare. My aunt taught me to do them when people had forgotten their manners. Oh, give me strength. If that's just for my rudeness, I hate to see what you would do if you actually were angry at somebody, Paddington. <laughs> right, puppy? Oh God, no! Coerced, Pennington and Henry make their ways to the guild, disguised in some heavenly attire, catching the eye of a very nosy and intrigued security guard. Lovely day, isn't it? Unusually hot. Mm. Just like you. <laughs> and that, dear kid, is how you make a Harvey Weinstein production. Uh, no, wait. You really can't feel a thing. Huh. Nothing. That's how you make a Harvey Weinstein production. And to be fair, this is just a hilarious bit. Nevertheless, a comical escape, and huzzah! Pennington and the Browns have found proof the explorer, and his name, Montgomery Clyde. After that he secured the old film group we saw at the beginning of the movie. This sparks Pennington to feel homesick, as he looks sadly into his old, happy home. Then steps into it like a painting in Super Mario 64. If Mario can do it, so can that bear! So of course we need a third act breakup, but instead of some sort of misunderstanding or contrived stupidity. See Nier's review of MLP the movie coming soon for that. We have Kidman breaking into the Browns' house like a crazed loon in Psycho Mantis cosplay as she tries to catch her Pennington, though she fails or more accurately, Curry almost blows her up. While Pennington tries to explain himself honestly, he is outed quickly as a liar. This actually makes sense. He has no understanding of how things are over here, so he has no reference of what a gas mask is, so mistakes Kidman for an elephant. It's a misunderstanding due to a cultural barrier and their actual characters of trust, rather than characters being moronic. Though really, if he just described the- It's an elephant. An elephant? What? Well, it had the head of an elephant and the body of a snake. To marry the family artist, it probably could have been easily resolved when they realized the elephant had the proportions of a 50-year-old Academy actress. Now alone with the Brown family, cold, wet, and accompanied by a sad band, we should all be so lucky, Pettin takes a list of the Montgomery Clydes of London and searches for the explorer, but with no luck. Though he does meet the greatest girl in all of London,
before meeting the jerkiest guard in all of London. No real joke here, that's just a wonderfully dubbed line. But finally, Pennington, having lost all hope, finds the home of Montgomery Clyde. That's good. But he's dead. That's bad. But he has a daughter. That's good. Who's Nicole Kidman? That's bad. Can I go now? A lovely specimen like you shouldn't be out on the streets. You belong somewhere very special. And I know just the place. Is she gonna stuff him or... Stuff him? No, she literally wants to stuff Pantheon as according to her tragic backstory thanks to Montgomery Clyde sparing Pastuzzo and Lucy from being hunted by the Geographers Club. He and his family were ostracized by the most posh, frumpy, limey, tea-drinking weasels this side of Big Ben. Montgomery Clyde, I hereby revoke your membership of this hallowed guild. Geographers, turn your backs. Thus her papa went and opened a petting zoo, and without any wealth she became the dreaded middle class. After which she swore revenge, found that she would reclaim her family's fame and glory by taking one of the world's few talking bears and silencing them forever as a stuffed museum piece. Wait, wouldn't you become more recognized and wealthy by showing off the talking bear? I mean, I can already go to a museum and find dead stuffed bears there. I mean, this doesn't have any logic to it. Fair enough! Now Pennington has been snared by Crazy Kidman and is about to be stuffed, but she's luckily sold out by Mr. Curry, who I guess was getting revenge because his creepy elder advances were rebuked by her. I am not your honeypot. I never was. What? I'm gonna take your rotten flowers and get out of here. Go. It sure isn't due to feeling sorry for Pennington. Come the sequel, he's a bigger bear racist than before. Now the Browns make it on the scene and use their established gimmicks to make their way to save Pennington. Mary has her sewers, Miss Bird drinks a guard under the table, Judy uses Bear to communicate with Pennington, Jonathan uses friggin' explosives, and Henry nuts up and scales the outside of the museum walls to apologize and save Pennington. Up here! Is that you, God? What? It's just... You sound a lot more like Mr. Brown than I imagined. It is Mr. Brown! Pennington, no! If you join a religion, you're just giving Mr. Curry more reason to be racist towards you! Antics ensues, pop cultural references are made, and Pennington is now inches away from making it to the roof and freedom! But it's not over yet, as Kidman has cornered the family on the roof. Nothing a heartfelt speech can't fix. It doesn't matter that he comes from the other side of the world. Or that he's a different species. Or that he has a worrying marmalade habit. We love Paddington, and that makes him family. And families stick together. So if you want him, you'll have to take us all. Okay, then. When I say all... Oh, I've never stuffed a human before, but... Wait. Oh, wow, you went way off the deep end there. And what are you going to do with the bodies afterwards? Just have them as your new living room set? Now it's up to Paddington and a bunch of pigeons to save the day. <laughs> I think we realize now. We suck at this. Nice. Ah, the true savior, a drunk old lady. Truly the ideal British hero. Seriously, that's a whole setup for Mrs. Bird that I couldn't even get into, and I frankly think you need to see it to get a laugh out of it. You need to see this whole movie, as the movie ends as lighthearted as it started, with the Brown family plus one Paddington Brown having a playful snowball fight as one big happy family. 
I don't say this lightly. Penin is not only one of the best live-action cartoon adaptations I've ever seen, but Penin might very well become one of my new favorite movies of all time. I mean, if you've seen the rest of the review, you probably know why, but in, just in case you need a little breakdown of that. Paddington just encapsulates such a light-hearted glee that is missing from a lot of feature film entertainment. This isn't a big world-ending story, the dynamics aren't earth-shattering, this isn't trying to be hip to sell itself. It's simply Paddington, and that's it. The narrative is simple and engaging, its theming of finding a family and home in unfamiliar surroundings is a story anyone, child or adult, can relate to, and the characters, while simple, work off one another and deliver performances that are genuine. Unlike, say, Alvin and the Chipmunks, where Jason Lee feels tired by the first film and just dead inside by the fourth, Pennington 1 is not only an ideal feel-good movie, but its sequel, Pennington 2, is just as good. I highly recommend to go out and watch both movies. In a time of cynical, cash-hungry kids' films, sometimes it's just nice to watch a charming little story that just makes you feel good. So get a bit more positivity in your viewing experience and go out and watch Pennington 1 and 2. I highly recommend it. But for now, we'll place the positive on the shelf. As for next time, we'll be dealing with a movie that has a history of involving scat. And I don't mean the music style. Yeah. So, until then, I'll see you guys next time on Cartoon Corner. Bye. Thank you for watching Cartoon Corner, everyone. If you want to keep up with the CC reviews, please consider subscribing to Tubegrid's new YouTube channel and clicking the bell icon to be notified of every upload. Apart from that, follow Tubegrid on all our social media to keep up the date on our shenanigans. And as always, be sure to tune in to Tubegrid. Peace.